Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I'm Richard. I am Brad. And welcome to our 37th episode. Really? Is it is it 37 or 36? It is 37, my friend. I think we have run the gauntlet of podcasts. Let me just double check so I have to edit it later. Yeah, man. This is episode 37. And it wow. is also the second year of Hello, This is the Doom Show. Looks like we made it. Even though we had sex with a dog, baby. <laughs> That's how that song goes, right? That is exactly how that song goes. <laughs> we rely on each other, dog fucking. No, it's not. I don't know. I'll probably cut all this out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Fuck it. I don't care. Mm. <laughs> So, yeah, happy anniversary, dude Happy anniversary to you, sir. It was actually two months ago, but we forgot, so we just remembered. So now we have a new anniversary, so now next year, our anniversary is in July. So there you go. You like that? I'm going to I'm gonna try to push it to where we're celebrating our anniversary every episode. Oh. Welcome to our 25th anniversary. We've actually been doing this for two and a half years. That's right. Uh, oh, yeah, and we're also going to talk about Lady Frankenstein. We're going to celebrate um, ourselves and this show, and we're going to celebrate the fuck out of Lady Frankenstein. I love Lady Frankenstein. So do I. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it to it, Mountain Dew. Um, mm-hmm. Shall we just go right into it? Do you want to do that or feedback? Oh, yeah, why don't we do a little feedback at the top of the hour? <laughs> top of the hour. I'm a fucking radio DJ. Oh, my God. Anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, we are open to feedback on this show, and we love it. Now, um, we're like three episodes ahead here, so this feedback happened at the end of July. <laughs> and this show will probably right. go up like in August sometime. So uh, keep the feedback coming and we'll get to it. We'll be like those other shows that have to do like two part feedback episodes mm-hmm. where they have like, they'll have three and a half hours of uh, phone messages on their, on their Skype. We're not going to be that shit. We're not going to do that. No, 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 we never get it. We rarely get, I, I'm not setting up feed. a phone call. Service. Phone call service. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> I'm not paying some damn uh German lady to sit there on a, a switchboard and take calls for us for $44 an hour. No, we're not going to do that. May I mention also that today we are recording and it is Mario Baba's birthday. That's so crazy. 99 years old, he would be. That's really crazy. Uh, Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, he actually auditioned for Rosalba Neri's role in Lady Frankenstein. I did not know that. He did. They said his tits were too big. They wanted someone more athletic looking. Uh, That's why he was so good in, um, what was it, Uh, Salon Kitty. What? We're off the rails early. (laughs) Oh yeah, so feedback. Uh, (laughs) Like I say at the end, like I say, (laughs) like I say at the end of every show, uh, doomedmoviethon at gmail dot com is how you get a hold of us, or you can go to our Facebook page and drop us a few words of encouragement or discouragement, and that's what we got here um, on our. Argento episode. We had some feedback. Um, first up is from Tyler. And uh, he says, uh, that episode was amazing, guys. Uh, you guys keep topping yourself with awesome episodes. I can't wait till until Argento Part 2. Um, 
He also compliments my web, my, my vlogs. I've been doing the unseenly. I've been recording those on the YouTube there. He says, keep up the great work. And he says, Brad, you're awesome too. Thank you, Tyler. Um, oh, and he says, the Pokemon Giala line made me die laughing. And he needs to rewatch Trauma. I agree. Me too. I wholeheartedly endorse that idea, Tyler. Um, I wonder when uh, Argento's going to break down and finally make the Pokemon Giallo, man. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how much he's looking forward to Argento Part 2 if you end up pulling the 2000 films as a <laughs> Part 2. I don't think I can. I don't think I. I don't even know what the next Argento Part Two will be. We'll we'll concoct something. <laughs> we'll scheme. We'll scheme on that. Uh, maybe, yeah. We'll, we'll uh, maybe we'll uh, go back in time a little bit and do some uh, some more classics. Um, I see that uh, Martin Luther Presley is back. I thought maybe yes that uh, we could not run him off with our talk of World War Two or. Uh, any of that, but then we had him watch uh, the sinister eyes of Doctor Orloff and ran him off with it. That's right. Well, well, um, I'm sure Martin Luther Presley, like the rest of us, we've all we've all gotten over the war. <laughs> but uh, I have finally. No, it's good. He says he uh, Martin Luther Presley says he's taking us on vacation with him. So. We're going to be... I'm having a great time. We're going to be flying over some European nation with him. We'll be in his ears. Or other orifices. So, the other feedback we have is from uh, Jeffrey of the Nessun Tamore blog. Uh, he wrote on the Facebook page that he's totally surprised at our loathing for Phantom of the Opera. Terrible? Certainly. But worse than Giallo or Dracula 3D, you've got some splaining to do. <laughs> uh-huh. Of course he means Argento's Phantom of the Opera, which I never said it was bad. Did you say it was bad? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was I was all for it. Until I read my <laughs> list of 17 things I hated about it. <laughs> um, it, it is, <laughs> it, it is bad. Yeah, and I I know you have not seen Dracula 3D, no, but I have, <laughs> and I would rather watch Dracula 3D, nice, than Phantom of the Opera. Giallo, I told him I'd save my opinion for the show, yeah, but uh, it's yeah, I have I have a minor quibble with Giallo and a major complaint about Giallo, but I will save that. Um, but yeah, I would, I would watch Giallo before I'd ever watch Family Opera again. Oh, I was just going to say, he goes on to say that at least we can all agree that the card player is the best horror film of all time. And he's dead on with that one. So true. <laughs> hey, but you know what? Internet poker's still around. So in our faces, right? Right. Argento's like a prophet or something. He's, he is writing the gospel of the 20th century. <laughs> I mean the twenty first. Whoops. <laughs> I don't even. I don't even know what year it is. I still so think it's the nineties. I don't 90s. know how old I am. <laughs> you were announcing your age at the beginning of every show. Remember? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I've got a new segment I'd like to debut. What's that? It's called Complaints from Elizabeth. Let's hear it. The last two weeks, our shows have been shorter than usual, and she's like, "What if? Have you just got nothing to say?" About these movies? And I'm like, no. I'm like, not every show has to be epic, Elizabeth. And then she hit me in the face. <laughs> Brad is a battered husband. <laughs> exactly. So you guys can look forward to a new segment every week or every time we come out called Complaints from Elizabeth. I want to hear more. I think it's really... Yeah, I think it's because that... uh that she enjoys time without me. I oh, yeah. Well, it's her show, too. too. True. True. No, yeah, we have been doing some short episodes. I kind of like the short ones, though. I mean, it, it, it's not like we've been scrimping. Right. You know, we've been... That Argento show was long, was it not? Two hours. There you go. 
I still can't believe we did that Bava show. We we did um at one time we did almost four hours on just part of Lucio Fulci's career. Mm-hmm. And yet we kept the uh, the Bava show, the entire career of Mario Bava, under like two hours or something. Well, we always leave, even with our... We, we leave it open for actually doing episodes on sp- particular movies, because we did uh, the Vert- Vertilac segment of Black Sabbath in a show later. So, True. You True know. that. So yeah, those are feedbacks. Thank you guys. Yeah, Jeffrey, uh, I think he's a he just covered Giallo on his blog, and I think the the only one left, I guess, would be Dracula 3D, and I'm I'm interested to see yeah what he says about that. I'm I'm waiting for a legitimate release on that here. I want that to come to the states, man. Yeah, because I got Giallo. I bought yeah. Giallo way quick. And I was like, yeah. yeah. It's a classic. I bought Mother of Tears. <laughs> oh, we definitely bought Mother of Tears. Yeah. yeah. I think I think the Mother of Tears show will be the controversial episode. But oh, no I won't go into that now. What evil science was practiced in this laboratory of nightmares? Who is this irresistible creature who has an insatiable love for the dead? What Red terror stalked the townspeople. The legend of Frankenstein once again brings terror and nightmare to the street. is Baron Frankenstein, the scientist who dared to create a monster. (laughs) Meet Lady Frankenstein. She's beautiful, she's evil, and she'll do anything for love. Think of me. Think of possessing me. Would you like to have my body bend to you? Would you like to make love to me? She creates a new, more terrifying monster. I am my father's daughter. (laughs) You are referring to uh, animal transplants. Human. Only the monster she creates can satisfy her strange desires. No man can escape her web of terror. There has never been a movie like Lady Frankenstein. So Lady Frankenstein, y'all... Yeah. Uh, we're talking about a film from 1971, La Figlia di Frankenstein. I added that extra syllable to Frankenstein there. That wasn't actually there before. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. How's this IMDb plot? All right, here we go. When Dr. Frankenstein is killed by a monster he created... His daughter and his lab assistant, Marshall, continue his experiments. The two fall in love and attempt to transplant Marshall's brain to the muscular body of a retarded servant, Stephen, in order to prolong the aging Marshall's life. Meanwhile, the first monster seeks revenge on the grave robbers who sold the body parts used in the creation to Dr. Frankenstein. Soon, it comes after Marshall and the doctor's daughter. Written by Anonymous. So we don't know who wrote that. No, we do. We just don't want to give them credit. Okay, so, yeah, Mel Wells, a fine director, 
not an Italian person. <laughs> no. <laughs> what? Uh, Mel Wells. <laughs> did I just say not an Italian person? <laughs> you did. It was awesome. <laughs> His name is not really Melito Wellito. Yeah. He did direct a movie called Joyride to Nowhere. That sounds good. That's the that should be the subtitle of our show. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Fast track to nothing. So yeah, like like the, the IMDB failed to really communicate very well. Um Dr. Frankenstein, the Baron, played by Joseph Cotton, has been trying so desperately to, you know, get a corpse to reanimate and whatever. He's been uh experimenting on animals. But he's done with that animal bullshit. He wants to raise up human beings. And I don't mean by making babies. Anybody can do that. He wants to take a bunch of dead babies and put them together to make a whole man and raise them up. And his assistant, right. he doesn't have an Igor. He has a Paul Mueller in this one. Which is, which is much better than having an Igor, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, Paul Mueller has a hairier back than any old Igor. Exactly. <laughs> Forget the hump. Check out these bristles, bitch. <laughs> smooth, smooth. Man, I've seen that man's hairy butt. Or not hairy butt. His bare butt. His hairless butt. <laughs> Thanks, Jess Franco. Thank you for nothing. Oh, Jess. <sighs> so, uh, they're failing because they're losers at raising corpses from the dead. And, uh, Tanya Frankenstein, played by Sarah Bay, also known as Rebecca de Mornay. No, wait. Rosalba Neri. Oh, did I tell you I started smoking crack tonight? <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> well, here we go. Crack pipe. All right. Crack pipe. So Rosalba Neri shows up. She's been off at school learning to be a surgeon, which is something that women are just now starting to do in the real world. Mm -hmm. She comes back, and she totally tells her dad, like, yeah, I know what you've been doing, bruh. She's been spying on them. She found a secret passage into the, lab the, uh, the laboratory, and uh, she's been watching them uh, do crazy shit for, since she was a little girl, and of course... She's also a crazy and uh, wants them to, you know, let her help them work on corpses of people to reanimate them. Mm -hmm. Joseph's Cotton. Joseph's Cotton. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Try Joseph's Cotton. He has been using a grave robber named Tom Lynch, played by Herbert Fuchs. That's how we're going to pronounce it on this show. Buddy. Okay. Herbert Fox has been helping him steal corpses. He's a shady character. Shady as fuck. Uh, him as Fuchs. Him and uh, Simon Burke, which sounds very familiar. Thinking Burke and Hare a little bit here. Uh, uh -huh. They've been stealing corpses and bringing them, you know, fresher and fresher bodies. Uh, he's paying them, and there's all this, like, tension between them, because Tom Lynch is a scumbag, and is going to probably turn and try to blackmail Joseph Cotton. And, of course, hot on the heels of Mr. Tom Lynch, the grave robber, is Mickey Hargitay as Captain Harris. And I gotta say, I love me some Mickey Hargitay. He is a very... Um, determined policeman, and he is trying to bust this Tom Lynch guy for something, anything, because he knows he's a piece of shit. Hasn't found a way to make anything stick yet. So you got all these people, you know, doing their thing. So they totally uh, raise the dead of a uh, some guy that was hung for murder, and they get the body. It's a really ugly, hideous creature. They raise it from the dead. It immediately kills the Baron. Goes on a rampage. And then, fucking A, man. Like, Tanya's like, let's do this. So they start concocting a plan to raise the dead. 
they get poor Steven. Was his name Steven in the movie? Or did he have a different name? Thomas? Thomas, thank you. That's stupid, uh... That stupid fucking anonymous asshole messed me up. So Thomas, the very special person, uh, they, they kill him in a very erotic scene. Because, of course, not only is Tanya Frankenstein interested in re- raising the dead, she's also a total pervert. She kills Thomas, not Stephen, and they put Paul Mueller, Dr. Charles Marshall, his brain into Thomas's body with the hopes that they can have hot, undead sex and kill the original monster. That's the plan. And it does not work <laughs> out so good for them. And that's the plot. In nine million words or less. How'd I do? <laughs> Great. Good. I feel Ooh. like I've seen the movie. I started again. to think I really was smoking crack for a few seconds there. Brad, how yes. do you like Lady Frankenstein? Okay. I first came to Lady Frankenstein in a cheapo horror film pack that my brother bought for reasons I still don't understand. Um, and it came with Mutant, which I really enjoy. Ooh, I like Mutant. Uh, yeah, Wingshauser. Yeah. Um, and I watched it that way. So, then I found out they were going to put out the uncut version. And I swooped that up. It's a Roger Corman pack with films that he had very little to do with other than finances, as far as I can tell. Uh, and I, I watched the, just the regular version because it's not seamless. It's not seamless branching. There's a little pause in the film before it goes to the scenes that are cut. I know that DVD drive-in put out, uh, a cut of this, uh, years ago. So I had never watched the uncut version and we'll get into what, you know, what we think about the uncut version. But I had not seen the uncut version until we decided to do it for the show. I like it quite a bit. You've got a ton of talent in front of the camera with uh, Joseph Cotton, Paul Mueller, and Rosalba Neri, and Mickey Hargitay. I really like Mickey Hargitay. I really enjoyed Delirium, although I don't know what happened (laughs) in it. And I also enjoyed... um, Oh, uh, what's the other one he did with a guy that directed Delirium? It's got a couple different names. Um, help me out there. Oh, my God. Let me look it up. Was it Reincarnation of Isabel, was it? Yes, thank you. Okay. It makes even less sense than Delirium. <laughs> nice. I don't have any idea. Uh, seriously, uh, it was beautiful. It was beautifully shot. I, I, if I if you were like, what was that film about, Brad? I'd be like, I don't have any idea. <laughs> uh, and I also really enjoy Bloody Pit of Horror that he was in. So I like Mickey Hargitay. But watching the uncut version adds a lot to the film. Uh, it appears to be taken from a TV broadcast and uh, maybe like a Greek... Uh, I think a Greek... Was- I think it was Dutch, actually. I think it was one of those Dutch subtitled ones. I uh, hold on, I can tell you, um, because as I, it's Swedish. Oh, okay. Hey, we were both right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it was a country in Europe that I've never been to, nor will I ever go to. <laughs> um, it adds a lot to the film, and it's funny because I really enjoyed the film without the extra stuff. But the extra stuff has a lot to do with character motivations. Uh, I still feel like maybe this is not the complete cut, because if you watch it with the extra scenes added in, it's still, there's some editing things where I'm like, huh. Like the creature's rampaging, and all of a sudden he's not. It's just some odd cuts. It could just be, you know, me. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, I, Mel Wells, I don't know why he didn't direct more because he did a really good job with this. There are things that I really enjoy. The monster makeup is different. Uh, 
you don't really have any sympathy whatsoever for the monster, which is a little different than normal. He's just on a rampage. You you actually find out more about his motivations in the uncut. You think he's just out to kill whatever he runs across, but actually he does have a plan. Um, he goes after all the people involved with making him. The people that, excuse me, stole his body. The doctor, obviously, he's coming after Dr. Marshall. Yeah. Uh, you get more of a sense that Mueller is there, is still with the Baron because he loves uh, Lady Frankenstein. Right. Um, you get more a better sense of that. You also get... Uh, there's a scene that's cut where, at the beginning, where she mentions how attractive she finds Thomas, even though he is mentally deficient. Yes. And you get a scene of interaction between them that you don't in the regular cut that, that comes on all those, you know, cheap DVD sets. So, without the extra scenes, it just seems like there's no motivation for her. Uh, you get extra stuff about the Baron. The Baron, they mentioned in a, in a cut scene that uh, the Baron tried some experiments on Thomas already to make him smarter. So you kind of get an idea that he's not just your standard mad scientist; that he's actually he's trying to do good. Also, um, I've got some trivia uh, on the film that comes. It all comes from uh, Video Watchdog number seventy-eight. From 2001, there is uh, an excellent in-depth article by Tim Lucas on the film itself. And then there's an interview after that by, T by Tim Lucas where he interviews Mel Wells. Uh, you had sent me this, and oddly enough, it was in it was not in my stack of video watchdogs. So I began to think, did I dream that? Mm -hmm. And then I finally found it, and I was like, oh, thank God. Um, and I had not read it before because I was waiting to see the film again. Yeah. So, of course, this was the perfect opportunity. Um, and uh, like I said, all this is courtesy of you sending me this video, Watchdog. And uh, as usual, Tim Lucas did a very, very good job. Um, it was originally, well, Mel Wells uh, directed the dubbing in a ton a ton of European films. Oh, yeah. He directed the English dub in, in Dr. Hitchcock, Castle of the Living Dead, The She-Beast, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, Deep Red, Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory. Wow. Uh, he claimed to have directed the dubbing for, and done quite a bit of the dubbing, for um, Blood and Black Lace, but Tim Lucas mentions to him that if he did, it's a copy that he had not seen at that point anyway. Because Paul Fries did a lot of the voices in that. So, uh, he he originally, they, a guy came to him with a script called Lady Dracula about a vampire in a funeral home. Uh, he got the funding together. Uh, the produ original producer wanted to, basically wanted to make a movie for Rizal Baneri because he was uh, trying to get her in the sack. So I can't say that I blame him. Yeah. So, and he's like, I'll just make a movie and have her the star. Well, the funding fell through, and Mel Wells had worked with Roger Corman before. So, Corman stepped in because he had, he had already cast Joseph Cotton, and Cotton was just coming off the abominable Dr. Fives. So, Corman stepped in with some money. So, later when Corman hacked it up, Wells couldn't really say anything because he had he had given him the money to make it. Right. Uh, the interiors, a lot of the interiors were filmed at Dee Paulus Studio, where they also filmed a bunch of movies, including Flesh, Flesh for Frankenstein. Uh, the biological props that you see, the brain, the heart, those were created by a guy named Carlo Rambaldi, whom we've mentioned many times mm -hmm. on this show. They were also, those same props were used in Fulci's Lizard in a Woman's Skin. Nice. And Flesh, and Flesh for Frankenstein. Wow. This film is commonly thought to be um, an influence on Flesh for Frankenstein. I can see it because even though 
some of the Hammer Frankenstein films had some sexuality in them, they really didn't go into, like, sex with the creature. Right. Which you get in this, not the creature, but a creature. Uh, the voice of Paul Mueller was done by an African-American guy, which is funny because he doesn't sound African-American at all. That's awesome. Um, and that's straight from the interview that Tim Lucas did with Mel Wells. Um, the, ex the extra scenes, like I said, I think they really add a lot, a lot of characterization that the film didn't need to be enjoyable because I always enjoyed the film before, but I think this really fleshes it out and even it bumps it up a couple of notches in my estimation. What do you think? Yeah, I, um, I held off on watching the uncut one because it was going to freeze and everything or, or pause. Um, mm -hmm. and then the first time I watched it the other night where I'm watching the uncut version, it froze the first cut scene. My DVD player said, fuck you. So I had to fast forward past and then rewind before and then hit play and the scene played out. And then the rest of the times it jumped to those scenes, it, it held its own. It did pretty good because there's a, there's a lot of them. There's not just like, you know, three or four. There's several scenes that are. Oh, yeah, several. Yeah. So um, I like it. I, I think you're exactly, uh, or, um, you hit it on the nose there that they add character depth, um, uh -huh. which I think is funny. They're not just filler. They're actually really cool scenes. Because um, the first time I saw this, just like you, I was watch I watched it uh, for the first time on a budget uh, collection of movies, and I loved it. The first viewing, even on that full-frame garbage cut, it just... I didn't know anything about Rosal Benary, you know... I didn't know anything about Joseph Cotton. I didn't know anything about anything. Um, I always thought this was a, this was a completely Italian production mm -hmm. um, until I was researching, finding a longer cut. Because um, at one point, it was this is just my thinking. I, I don't know why I thought this. It was my thinking that every time you found a good Italian film on a budget collection, you were watching a censored version. Which, it's not always true, but that's how I just, my my instinct was, okay, I want to see this movie again, I want to see it in full firm, I mean, um, wide screen, but I also want to see the uncut version, and I just got so used to saying that, that everything became this, like, conspiracy against me to ever find uncut movies. Um, and it turns out that what had been cut from Lady Frankenstein wasn't any gore or nudity. It was just character stuff. Um, and I found out that Mel Wells, that's not an Italian name. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, this was a, a, an Italian American co-production and the world is the better for it because this is one of those hybrids that really, really just nails it. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say enough about this movie. I mean, uh, there's a couple moments that are a little drab. That's my biggest criticism that, um, there's not always style throughout. There's some, um, functional plotting stuff that's has to happen. That doesn't exactly blow me away. Uh, but for the most part, the sets are great. The atmosphere is there. Um, I love the score. Who did this score? Oh, yeah, Alessandro uh, Alessandroni. He is awesome. I think he did uh, Killer Nun. Is that one of his? Ooh, I don't know. Uh, oh, he did Devil's Nightmare, which is amazing. So, yeah, he did the music for Killer Nun. Um, the score in this has that... Dun, dun, dun. Like, it's, so, it's, <laughs> it's so fun. And that's another thing about this movie is this is a lot of fun. It has all that weird sexual undertone, creepiness, sometimes not such an undertone as just a tone. Um, and But it's such an entertaining film. The monster, like you're saying, looks different from other monsters because everybody had to make their own. Either 
to outdo other movies or just to avoid getting sued by the Frankenstein, you know, the people who own the rights to the universal version. So everybody made their different creatures. But this one is so weird. He's got a light bulb head. And the I, one thing about this movie, I've watched this movie so many times. Do you know why his face gets burned? Did you notice that? The lightning. Yeah, but the lightning, like, strikes a bat. Yeah. And I think pieces of the burning bat fall and melt his face. Huh. That's what I really think happened. Because they, they make it a point to show those bats getting all stirred up from the lightning. And then something strikes the lightning and some debris falls. And I thought, I think it's supposed to be one of the bats falling on his face. Paul Mueller, I, I can't believe I never noticed this guy until I saw him in Jess Franco movies. Like, I really like Paul Mueller. Um, he's great. Oh, I do too. I love his character. His character is, um, he's he's a he's a cripple, but you know his his limp is not very pronounced. Uh, I think the main thing is you're supposed to understand that he has failing health. Right, and I think he's also playing a much older man. Uh, but yeah, him, him, and uh, Lady Frankenstein have some issues. Um, like her, he reasons that she was just in love with the idea of creating another monster. That she was not in love with him as much as she was with putting his brain in another body. Well, I think later she realizes that she does love Charles. Right. But yeah, he has his doubts and it kind of causes the whole thing to blow up. Oh, yeah. I mean, besides the town people with their torches and the monster destroying everything. Uh, The monster, there's a moment in the movie where the monster screams like it's just like a close up of the monster and he just lets out this, you know, ghoulish wail, you know, and I'm like, man. I love this movie. Like, <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, and his rampaging is really satisfying. Like, I love the monsters rampaging in this movie. He picks up a naked girl and throws her in a lake, and it's like <laughs> it's he just kind of be... gently drops her into a lake. Oh yeah, it's not so much a throw as a <laughs> and she goes in the water hard, like bam. You know? <laughs> she does. So that's supposed to be echoing the scene where. Frankenstein throws a little girl in the water, you know. <laughs> now that little girl's all grown up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, this is, this is, I, I will watch this over and over again. If they put out another version, you were, you're saying you don't understand why they didn't just put out a proper version without all the jumping scenes and shit. Uh huh. There is a guy in this that it evidently is uncredited on IMDb, but mm. I'm pretty sure he's the guy that uh, is in Contraband and 2019 after the fall of New York. He looks somewhat like Richard Mulligan from Empty Nest. Oh. He is, he is, he's, I think it's, his name is Zach in this film. He's the one that tells Mickey Hargitay, we put 20 bullets in him. And he's like, 20, are you sure? Well, it had to be 10, or 5, or 4. He's not human. But I'm pretty sure that's the guy. And, of course, I've been hounding you to watch 2019 After the Fall of New York for forever. I know. I know. It's in my queue. Such a great movie. I'm looking forward well, to it. I think it's a great movie. Let's talk about the ending. Is that one of the best endings ever? Man, it is some cold-blooded, hot, sexy shit. Like, so, the world is coming to destroy uh, uh, Tanya Frankenstein and her newly uh, brained lover, the uh, the Thomas Dr. Marshall creature. Um, and they're just starting to enjoy each other's company when the monster shows up. Uh, he is now going to take his revenge on them, and uh, the townspeople have fucking had it, and they show up with their pitchforks and uh, 
torches. Oh, and um, um, Captain Harris, uh, Mickey Hargathay, he shows up too, and uh, they're going to have a little lynch party here. Um, the monster gets in the castle first, and he is destroying the lab and trying to uh, get to Dr. Marshall. But the monster doesn't know that Dr. Marshall's brain has been put into Thomas. So when the monster sees Thomas, it kind of doesn't rampage. Until Thomas opens his mouth, starts speaking, and the monster recognizes Dr. Marshall's voice. Even though his voice would be different because he's in someone else's body, but hey, whatever. Um, so they have a monster brawl, the pretty boy versus uh, the light bulb head. Mm -hmm. They trash everything. Um, Tanya decides to step in and help out. Um, she stabs the monster through the chest, but it does not, not very, f wait, he cuts off the monster's arm, then she stabs the monster through the chest, and right when the monster is going to kill Tanya Frankenstein, he buries an axe in its big old light bulb head. And yes. then the two of them just think it's perfect timing to get their freak on, and while the castle is burning around them, they're making love. Meanwhile, Captain Harris, and a chick I have not mentioned until now, because I totally forgot about her, Thomas's uh, sister, right? Yes. She's been looking for Thomas this whole time. I think her name is Julia, uh, played by Renate Cache. She... And Captain Harris are standing on the balcony watching the laboratory burn, and they happen to see um, Tanya Frankenstein and the Thomas creature making love while the whole place is coming down around them. And out of nowhere, the creature, the sexy creature, strangles Rosalbinary to death. And that's the end of the movie. Someone on IMDb commented that it's possibly just that the creature always kills the creator. And I, I like that. Myself. Yeah, me too. I mean, to be fair, she did use her sexy charms uh, to get the innocent Thomas into bed with her so that Dr. Marshall could uh, smother him with a pillow. Right. So maybe, you know, there was enough of Thomas left, or maybe uh, uh, Dr. Marshall just decided to end it all, you know. I know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice, it's a cool ending. You can freaking, it's not arbitrary, you know, you can, it's, but it is open-ended. No, it ended on a high note, and I, I, it's interesting because Tim Lucas mentions in his uh, his article that when they kill Thomas, she is sexing him up, and then Paul Mueller comes up from behind and smothers him with a pillow, and it's not unlike a scene that Paul Mueller was in in Eugenie de Sade, which we covered. And I was like, yeah, right on. Nice. It's all coming together. <laughs> coming. Me. <laughs> Two things that I want to mention in the uncut version when Joseph Cotton is relating a story, he talks about a Dr. Mueller, and you see Paul Mueller kind of looking down like he's trying to keep from laughing, which I thought was kind of funny. I did not notice that. And then, yeah. And in the dubbing, when, uh, when uh, Mickey Hargitay first shows up on the scene where the Baron is dead, uh, Paul Mueller says he had to be at least a half a foot taller than you. And Mickey Hargitay says, well, that would make him over seven feet. And Mueller says, well, he had to be at least half a foot taller than you. 
And I don't know if that was a, a, a screw up in the, like if he meant to say, well, he was three inches taller than you or something different, but he says the same thing twice. And I thought that was kind of funny. You know, it's the craziest things. Oh, uh, no. But uh, I highly recommend this film. I highly recommend getting the uh, uncut version and watching it. Uh, the few scenes that there's, of course, there's a noticeable difference in quality between uh, what has been remastered and the what appears to be a TV uh, broadcast. And then there's definitely a difference in the Swedish videotape insert because oh, okay. you've got Swedish subtitles and it looks like a, a bad VHS rip. I mean, you could see it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I highly recommend, you, you know, people getting this. It's on a four set with uh, Time Walker, Grotesque, and The Velvet Vampire. Oh, boy. What a weird set. Uh, I, mean, I, I haven't have seen, seen The Velvet seen... Vampire and Time Walker yet, but Grotesque uh, alone is quite a chore. Quite a chore. Ugh, I, try, I, I almost turned it off, but I got through it. Um, it has the, uh, I don't, I don't want to spoil it, even though it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I also recommend this movie to anybody who's, you know, even the budget version is fine. I mean, it's not, that's how I discovered no, it. I agree. So, and if, if you find it on uh -huh. YouTube or something, watch it. Um, I will be, uh, triple dipping if this ever comes out on Blu-ray. Uh, this is, this is a go-to title and this is a fun title. I mean, you have folks over that aren't too frickin' uh, squirrely about nudity. I mean, and it's not even that much, but, you know, uh -uh. this is definitely a fun time movie. Mm-hmm. Well, I you agree. Can, you can tell everybody that Herbert Fox is in it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Mel Wells actually dubbed the voice for uh, dear old Herbert. So that's actually Mel Wells' voice you're hearing. Nice. Yeah, there there was a great uh, there's a great issue of Video Watchdog all about the voice actors. It's really fascinating. So, what else? Oh, um, the cinematographer actually is pretty interesting for this movie. Um, this dude uh, shot a lot of movies. Um, cinematographer. Ricardo Palotini. Um, he shot uh, Massacre Time, uh, Lucio Fulci's Massacre Time. Uh, he shot Blind Man. Uh, he shot The Killer Must Kill Again. Uh, Magnum Cop. Take a Hard Ride. Execution Squad. All kinds of shit. Ooh, did he shoot that one? Oh, yeah, he shot... Um, I don't know if you've seen this one. Um, Antonio Margariti did a... Uh, spaghetti Western with Richard Harrison called Vengeance. I have it, but I've not seen it yet. It's good. It's good. That, that's a that's a good-looking movie, too. So I like uh, Ricardo Palatini. Rod over at Nashy Cast has been championing Antonio Margariti for a while, so I've been stockpiling his movies for a big um, Antonio Margariti thon. Margarita. So we're gonna take a break and continue. Oh, I'm sorry, we we were done talking about Lady Frankenstein. I'm done. Yeah, go see it. Yeah. So yeah, we're gonna take a break, and uh, we are going to. I, I'm hijacking question time for this episode to celebrate all the broken condoms on the floor that we do when we make this show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right now, we are going to play 
the last 36 episodes for you. So just enjoy all of our shows ever. Okay, you got the tape, Brad? I do. Hold on a second. All right. Okay. All right, we're all queued up. All right, thanks, folks. We'll see you in the next 37 episodes. Bye. We don't have a tape. I made that up. I don't have a tape player. I do. I've got a mini disc player. <laughs> you have a, you and your uh, mini disc player. You, <laughs> you and Matt Torrance can have a rave. Matt Torrance is the Definitely. only other person I know with mini disc play. <laughs> Tim, my uncle Tim. One day he's like, "Oh, I bought us something." I'm like, "Okay, what you buy?" He's like, "I bought us both a mini disc player." And this is like. I don't know, 2006? No. And, and he's like, they were cheap. I'm like, I bet they were. It's a dead technology. But, I mean, it's awesome. I like playing with it. Yeah, you can, you it can get really good, good recordings. Just, yeah. But I'm like, you know, we're, you know, in another year or so, we probably won't be able to find discs. No. You know? No. It was neat, though. I've got it sitting over there. Carl t- talked about it when he was up here. That's hilarious. Oop. I, uh, I want to get one of those Sony Walkmans. Man. My favorite thing ever was finding, not purchasing, actually finding on the ground one of those waterproof Sony Walkmans. Oh, a yellow one? The, the, yeah, the big yellow clunky case that would lock your tape inside of it. I fucking I found one those. laying on the ground. Really? Yeah, you, I used it for years until it finally started eating tapes. Man, I had one of those. I was bad about getting angry and throwing them. I threw a lot of CD players, too. (laughs) And I have the last CD player that I bought still because I got an iPod. And so I was never angry at that CD player anymore. So I never threw it (laughs) and broke it into a million pieces. Nice. I was, uh, I was obsessed with finding the perfect Walkman. I would, uh... I would spend $25 on a Walkman, throw the garbage headphones that came with it in the garbage mm-hmm. where they belonged, and then buy a $10 pair of headphones. And that was how I got the best sound. My yeah. mom was infuriated. She's like, why are these headphones in the trash? And I'm like, um... Duh, they're garbage. Why didn't you buy the nicer Walkman? Because the nicer Walkmans break just as fast as the cheaper ones do. Yeah. So, there you go, Mom, in your face. I mean, obviously Sony makes a ton of money, but I do feel bad in a way that... You know, they make an MP3 player that's in the Walkman series. It's just, I've never seen anybody with one. Right. Well, I've never, I've never bought an iPod. I, I I mean, I bought an iPod used from a friend of mine. She had a Nano that I bought from her for $40, and I used it for years. Now I have a Kobe MP3 player that was $39, and it's like 16 gigs or some crazy shit. Uh-huh. And it works fine. The only thing I don't like about it is I can't listen to podcasts on it, because it, it can't pause an hour and a half show. So when I'm listening to, let's say, The Hysteria Continues, and they're talking about, it's a cat, flushing the toilet, it's a cat, flushing Uh the toilet, I will listen to that show for another 20 minutes and pause it, because someone says something to me, and I'll open, I'll, um, I'll open, I'll take my headphones out of my ears and go, what? And I put my headphones back in, hit play, and it goes back to, it's a cat. Flush in the toilet, it's a cat. I'm like, it just fucking rewound 15 minutes. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, so it's not good for that, but I don't need a fancy uh, MP3 player because as long as it sounds good, and usually that is all your headphones anyway. What are we talking about? Oh my god. <laughs> Welcome back to the two oldest motherfuckers doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> It's our anniversary show. We can talk about whatever we want. Remember in my day when we carried our phonograph players around on our backs and we would encourage people to stop throwing pine cones. You're making my Duke Ellington skip around. 
God bless you. Wow. <laughs> Me and my Scott Joplin. <laughs> oh, you scratched my Pat Metheny record, you crippled fuck. I can't hear my ragtime. I just dropped some Pat Metheny on you. Anyway. You did. And uh, mine is blown. I am stealing question time from Brad. You are. He has been having his time of life living on the high horse. Now it's my turn to shine on the now high horse. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's question time, Richard style. Um, Brad, what are some of your... This is a two-parter, by the way. What okay. are some of your favorite non-horror directors? Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, I'd have to say I really like Francois Truffaut, Peter Bogdanovich, um, Jacques Tati. Uh, I really like Christopher Nolan. Ooh. Uh. Let's see. Hitchcock, if you don't consider him horror, and I don't. <laughs> um, I'm a big Hitchcock fan. I like uh, Richard Franklin, who directed Psycho 2 and Road Games. Uh, and he's a Hitchcock disciple. Let's see. Uh, Christopher Guest. I'm a huge Christopher Guest fan. Nice. Uh, the mockumentaries. I love Wes Anderson. That is a great question. I'm trying to think of some more. You turned me on to Jacques Tati. I like that dude a lot. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, have overlooked him. Dang, there's a lot. I like, uh, oh, the guy that did the, uh, the Euro crime before Euro crime, the, uh, with, uh, was it Melville? Yeah, yeah. I like him. I like. Like I said, Bogdanovich. I'm a big dog Bogdanovich fan. Let me look at my... Let's see. Ooh, I like Tarkovsky. like Solaris. And, uh... I'm surrounded by horror films, man. Uh, what else did Tarkovsky do? He did Stalker. He did Andre Rublev. Uh, the Mirror... It's, uh, usually he made really long films that are very ponderous. Let's see. Uh, oh, I like Fritz Lang quite a bit. I'm nice. a big Fritz Lang fan. Peck and Paw. I mean, a lot of the stuff you probably could figure, you know, uh, I like Del Toro. Uh, Polanski. I'm a big Polanski fan, even though I reckon he's a piece of crap. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rosemary's Baby. I like his Macbeth. I like The Tenet quite a bit. Um, what well, those are like horror? The oh, yeah, I guess you're right, yeah. Um, something non-horror that he did would be, <laughs> I don't know. So, let's count him out. <laughs> he, did, he did a movie <laughs> called What? Uh, he did. He did Knife in the Water, which is a thriller. Um... Yeah, a lot of those. Nice. Uh, I like uh, I like Coppola quite a bit. I know that that's pretty boring and vanilla, but oh, you know, oh. I like the the Godfather movies. I like the Conversation a lot. Yeah, Apocalypse Now. I'm a recent, fairly recent convert. There's nothing boring about him. <laughs> Just a lot of people like. Well, him. you know, nothing yeah, a lot that. of people like him. But yeah, those are some. I'm trying to. Of course, I'll think of a bunch. Nice. After we're done, and be like, "Why did I not mention the guy that did uh, the Conformist?" Is it was it Bertolucci? Yep, I like Bertolucci because he also did uh, the movie that you made me watch that I really enjoyed with Brando, and it, the name is escaping me at the moment. Last um, Tango in Paris. Last Tango in Paris. Yeah, that was a good movie. Oh yeah, yeah. All um, right, that's a great question. Are you are you ready for the follow up question? I'm ready for the follow-up This will be easier, I think. What are some of your favorite non-horror movies? Ah, okay. Uh, Playtime by Jacques Tati is a fantastic film. Yeah, it is. That I urge everyone to see if they haven't. I love it. Uh, I lo yeah, it is a great movie. 
great movie. It's long, but it moves very quickly. Um, I'm a big fan of What's Up, Doc, with Barbara Streisand. Oddly enough, it's the only film I can stand her in. Mm. But uh, it is a uh, it's a screwball comedy from the '70s with um, with her and Ryan Neal. Uh, a movie that I don't think gets enough credit is Nickelodeon by Bogdanovich. Is it Ryan? Uh, o- is it Ryan O'Neill? It may be Ryan O'Neill. Yeah, I think it's Ryan O'Neill. Oh, okay. Another film he's in is Nickelodeon. If you get the DVD, it's a Bogdanovich film. It was somewhat of a a flop, critically. But there's a director's cut on the DVD, which is in black and white. And it's got Burt Reynolds in it in an early, a semi-early film role. And it's really good. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Waiting for Guffman. And all the Christopher <laughs> Guest mockumentaries, uh, yeah. waiting for Guffman, Lord have mercy. Uh, I quote it all the time. Like this morning, I, I quote, I, I quoted it to you. It's the day of the show, y'all. Um, <laughs> I really enjoy it. I quote, uh, uh, this is my wife, Sheila. You may remember her from previous bills. Uh, <laughs> there's just, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Nice. Um, I like Carol and Maude quite a bit. Uh, my wife likes it even more than I do, I think. Oh, I'm just trying to think. A Man and a Woman is a movie that I really like. It's got uh, Jean-Louis Trinogen. Uh, if you haven't seen that, check it out. Uh, the Castle is a film that I really like. It's an Australian comedy that is infinitely quotable. It's about um, this family that lives next door to an airport... And they're all really, really stupid. Well, I don't know if they're stupid. They're naive. It is really one of those uh, comedies that it's it's heartfelt, but it's also very funny. And it's an early role for Eric Bana, Bana, who ended up being the Hulk and Nero in Star Trek. Uh, I'm a big Star Trek fan as well. I'm a big Wrath of Khan fan. Uh, gosh, let's see. I like a lot of those, um, like we were talking about the crime films, like uh, The Red Circle and uh, uh, Tony Arzenta, which you turned me on to. I'm a big fan of uh, the Euro crime films. Um, the, uh, there's a bunch. I like a lot of stuff. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was a huge Back to the Future fan. I never was a Star Wars fan, really, and I'm still not. Which is odd because most everybody my age is a Star Wars fan. Uh, Tim promised to take me to see a Donald Duck movie, and they still have not made one, so I bring that up periodically. <laughs> I'm like, I brought it up today. I'm like, remember when you were supposed to take me to see a Donald Duck movie, but you never did? He's like, they never made one. <laughs> I'm like, well, are, are you waiting on a live action one or no? Just a theatrical release of some sort. Okay. Scrooge McDuck won't cut it, huh? No. Solaris, I'm a big fan of Solaris. It is a long and ponderous film, but it is very, very good. Very good. Um, We go in cycles around here, uh, and I, it does seem like I've probably been in a horror cycle for quite a while, but now we do, you know, we're doing this podcast, and, you know, we've been watching a lot of Dark Shadows on uh, Netflix, and I'm a big Dark Shadows fan. We watched a murder she wrote last night that had some giallo overtones, nice. and it actually had a uh, had a guy from Dark Shadows. Just trying to think some other stuff. Uh, there's a indie film called Fishing with Gandhi that I really like. It's uh, it's funny and it's kind of quirky and it's bizarre. And I had not seen it in years. And Matthew ordered me a copy for my birthday. This year, and we watched it, and I just laughed and laughed and laughed. I didn't see that. Yeah, it's good. It's 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 a good movie. Um, but yeah, you know, I like a lot of European art films and stuff like that. I'm a huge Truffaut fan, man. Uh, Small Change, uh, Day for Night is just a brilliant film. Yeah. Uh, I have not seen a Truffaut that I didn't like in one way or another yet, and I've got a few more to go. There's a few that are hard to find. 
But yeah, I'm a huge Truffaut fan. I don't like Godard. And for some people, that's like film heresy. But I just I haven't seen a Godard film yet that I, I enjoyed. But I love Truffaut. Love Truffaut. My wife, we could sit down and watch all of Truffaut's films that we own. And she would love it too. Nice. But yeah, no, that's a good question. Maybe a little bit outside the horror realm. Okay. And Sometimes it has to happen. You're right, yeah. You do have to watch things other than horror from time to time. <laughs> what about you? Why don't you answer these questions? All right, I can handle that. Uh, favorite non-horror directors? Uh, I can uh, go with uh, Sam Peckinpah, definitely. Uh, uh, John Cassavetes, a big Cassavetes fan. Um, I haven't seen everything he's done, but I've seen, I think, the majority of it. Like, I really took a a liking to his stuff, thanks to a, a fucking Fugazi song. But, hey, whatever works. <laughs> See, and that's, ex- that's exactly what they intended when they did that. That's right. They're like, hey, check out this fucking guy's movies. Um... Let's see, uh, I like, uh, Akira Kurosawa, I like, uh, Mm. uh, Federico Fellini, I have problems with both of them, um, I have issues, I get very catty when I get my favorite directors going on, like, uh, uh, Fellini and Kurosawa are both long-winded motherfuckers, um, Mm -hmm. Kurosawa, it's okay that he's long-winded. Uh, Fellini is just fucking with you. Uh-huh. Um, Fellini is waiting for something to happen in real time. Like, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's like, okay, okay, you, uh, watching the movie, uh, I gotta think of something. Let me go sleep for a couple hours and dream up the next part. You wait here while the camera's running, you know? <laughs> like, uh-huh. no dick. Turn off the camera. It's called editing. No, I love Fellini, but I make fun of him all the time. Uh, it's a love-hate relationship. Uh, like you, I like Wes Anderson quite a bit. Um, oh, boy. He's disappointed me a little here and there, but overall I'm always really excited when he does a new movie. And see, that that's another way to show how different we are, because I, you're a big fan of the Ten- Royal Tenenbaums, and I've never been a huge fan of the Tenenbaums. Yeah. It's you know, that- still better than, like... I don't know, 80% of movies that came out that year, or maybe more. No doubt. No doubt. Um, who are some other non-horror people I like? Uh, uh, Takashi Miike is... I'm a huge fan of Takashi Miike. Um, he's done some horror classics, but uh, his any of his gangster films or... Um, outside of the genre type stuff is like he does movies that are multiple genres at once that are just fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. I love that dude. Um, he's currently making samurai films good again. I can't, can't give that guy enough credit for that. Um, uh, another dude. genre, another genre melding dude is a uh, Nagai Kai lamb. Um, he does. He did horror before he retired, but he really did movies that were action, sci-fi, epics, um, uh-huh. like Ricky, the story of uh, Ricky, and um, oh man, the Cat, One Thousand Years Cat. I mean, he's called kind of dip into horror, but they're just so damn weird. Um, he did a movie called uh, Killer's Nocturne. Um, if you can find that movie, it is amazing. Uh, the The hero spends the entire movie having movie having the shit kicked out of him so he can defeat the bad guys at the end, just because he's tougher than they are. It can take punches more. It's it's yeah. insane. The movie is nuts. Um, Two uh, that I left out that I will throw in right quick would be Howard Hawks and John Ford. Yeah. Yeah, I know n- literally nothing about those guys. <laughs> uh, than... Howard Hawks did uh, His Girl Friday. You you know that one, don't you? No. Sounds familiar. 
Cary Grant and uh, Rosalind Russell. Mm, no. It's a screwball comedy. You'd like that. That's that's, that's a great movie. Oh, I'd like to see it. Um, Orson Welles. Oh yeah, Welles. I left out Welles. Yeah. Man, I figured I figured you'd you want so me to mention right. that one. Yeah, you were yeah. so right on that one. <laughs> I like Orson Welles quite a bit, although I'm more fascinated by the man than his directorial movies. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just I, I'm a big biography reader. Um, would love to uh, tear into a decent biography on him. I don't know if there even is one. Hopefully. Hope so. Um, I keep giving Scorsese a chance. I'll, ne- I'll never really give up on Scorsese ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and Coppola, you know, for for certain things that Coppola has done that just blew me away, Rumble Rumblefish and Apocalypse Now, like we were talking about. I'm glad that I forced you to watch Apocalypse Now finally. Uh, who else do I like? Um, um, I like Stephen Chow. I. Uh, Oh yeah, you're a Chow fan. Uh, most of the stuff I've seen with him is him uh, acting and writing, not directing. But uh, what the films he directed are fucking outstanding. Uh, he's a very, very interesting character that could go either way right now. I have no idea what he's up to, but I'm really excited to see what else he's got up his sleeve. Sammo Hung, um, could not remember his name. <laughs> He is amazing. Um, another uh, actor turned director that I just love. Um, he's also a fucking brilliant uh, choreographer of fight scenes. I really love him. Okay, so uh, favorite movies? Easy. Uh, Repo Man is a favorite film of mine of all time. I quote Repo Man constantly. As unfunny as that is to do, I do it all the time. I'm a huge fan of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm. Um, I have I've never dressed and dragged and performed it anywhere, but I fucking love that movie. I'm a huge fan of the Dirty Dozen. Um, I love the Wild Bunch. I love uh, for a few dollars more. Although I'm not really a Sergio Leone fan. I, I like his movies, but a lot of his movies infuriate me because I saw Once Upon a Time in America and it ruined my life. Right, right. Uh, let's see what else are our favorites. Um, uh, RoboCop is a favorite movie of mine from my childhood. Nice. We talked. I think we talked about that before on this show. Uh-huh, I think so. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Strictly Ballroom. That's a, an amazing Australian film. Don't let anybody tell you it's not amazing. They're freaking dumbasses. You posted uh, I will, something about that today on Facebook, didn't you? I will. Yeah, exactly. I will soon. I will soon be uh, purchasing the Blu-ray of that. I, I, the movie is just outstanding. I'm a big fan of Get Over It, the teen movie. I love that one. Speaking of Cary Grant, what's the one where he gets divorced from his wife at the beginning of the movie, and they spend the whole movie trying to get undivorced? The Awful Truth. The Awful Truth. Thank you. I love yeah, that movie. Yeah, a great movie. It is. Uh, speaking of Stephen Chow, uh, The God of Cookery. <laughs> uh, the God of Cookery is the greatest human achievement in comedy. Um, I, I dare you. I dare anyone listening to find a funnier movie than The God of Cookery. It does not exist. It doesn't exist, so... There you go. Yeah, Last Tango in Paris. That's a great movie. Um, I like the existential content over the uh, erotic content, but um, it's it's just... I'm a huge Marlon Brando fan, and the more you know about Marlon Brando, the more impossible it becomes to be his fan. Um, the guy was a worthless piece of shit. Um... <laughs> Controversy. No, no. There's no controversy. Look that oh, shit up. Okay. He he actually caused um, a gonorrhea epidemic. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Look it up, Brad. <laughs> Google gonorrhea epidemic <laughs> and put Marlon Brando in quotes. <laughs> wow. Woo-hoo. Um... I'm a big fan of 
The Music Man. I'm a huge fan of that film. Obviously, a lot of that is my wife's influence. But I, I've come to recognize it as a perfect film. It is just wonderful. I think I'm running out of steam on these. It's tough to... It's This is so... It's hard to pick from a million great movies. Indeed it is. Um, I'm a big fan of... Oh, what's that Elvis movie? Brad, quick, name all the Elvis movies. Uh... Blue Hawaii, <laughs> Stale House Rock, uh, the one where he's blonde, the other one where he's blonde. Uh, no, no, I mean uh, movies double. he was on the soundtrack of. Oh, uh, Las Vegas, the TV show. There's 385 uh, fucking... <laughs> I don't know. I'm just fucking with you. Um, oh, it's Girl Happy. Girl Happy. Um, yeah, Elvis's Girl Happy, that's, it's, it's so funny, I can remember the whole plot, but I couldn't remember the name of it. He goes to, um, uh, to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to watch over his boss's daughter, make sure she doesn't get into trouble, and of course he ends up falling for her, and it's, it's one of the most obviously fake, stagey, I mean, I don't think there's a re- anything even remotely real in the movie anywhere. It's just so perfect. Like, it's all sound stages, and it's really like everyone seems to be feeling like this. This can go on forever, right? Like, they're all deluded into this false happiness of, like, oh man, these Elvis movies are great, everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be great. You know, <laughs> forty-five years from now, when people are watching it, right? So, yeah, I'm a I'm a big uh, Elvis movie fan. Not as much of a fan of his music, but I love his movies. So. Nice. Yeah, that's my long ponderous answer that I will edit into something cohesive. If you're lucky. Oh, I'm lucky because I edit the <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> I can make us sound brilliant, but I never do. But I never do. I, 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 never I have do. so much power, but, but I, I resist do. the urge. But I never do. But I never do. Well, it's because you're a modest man. Hell, yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh, man. So this is wrap up our second anniversary show or what? I just want to thank everybody for downloading and listening and sending in any feedback. And I know that I never thought we'd get this far. Hell, yeah. Um, it has been a point of pride and some shame that I refuse to pay anyone to host this show. So uh, I do appreciate our listeners that have held on. <laughs> um, Potomatic, you'll never get my money. Um, I promise you. This show will always uh, try to be free to you people. And because uh, we, Brad and I do this because we fucking love talking about movies and we love getting feedback. We love uh, being part of a community, even if it's just the two of us. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we've got so many people, <laughs> you know, from Jeffrey Canino to Aaron and Chris from the Mill Creeps, yep. Nashy Cast, Justin Koch, uh, or Kosh, excuse me, uh, Martin Luther Presley, oh, yeah. anybody that sent any feed ma- feedback, just everybody, and I just, we really appreciate it. Yeah, man. We're going to keep going until they tell us to stop. <laughs> uh, yeah. So thank you. Vegas. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, 37 episodes in two years. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably do better, but you, you know what's funny? Ironically enough, we are on a recording streak right now. We, we, broke, we broke our record and topped it one. To uh-huh. my knowledge, we never recorded three weeks in a row, ever. Not mm-hmm. only did we get four, Brad reminded me that we recorded five weeks in a row. That's crazy. Five. We've we've never been this productive. No. <laughs> and we even did like two episodes on one <laughs> Saturday once. Oh my god, that's right. I yep. oh my god, I totally forgot about that. That's funny. Oh man, that was that was good times. Yep. I'll probably never do that again. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
uh, we'll be back. Uh, episode 38 will be, we're going to return to Asian horror, uh, g- give the Italian horror a little rest. Uh, we're going to watch, uh, two of my favorites. Uh, I hope they're going to be Brad's favorites. Um, one is, uh, Kai- bleh, one is Cairo, uh, AKA Pulse. And the other one is Sick Nurses. Cairo's Japanese. And Sick Nurses, I think, is from the... Is Thai? Or Filipino? Oh my god, I can't remember. I have the slightest idea. Oh my god. Give me a second. They're all from Asia, though, right? The country of Asia? (laughs) Yep, where all the food comes from. Exactly. Brilliant guys, them. Ah, there you go, yep. Almost had it there. Yes, it, I, it was Thailand where uh, Sick Nurses is from. In fact, oddly enough, there is a DVD you can buy that has Sick Nurses and Pulse as a double feature. I did not know about this. Really? That is hilarious. So apparently somebody else thought this was a good combination. Well. <laughs> I'm, I think they were released by the same company over here. So it worked on me, man. So uh, I guess I highly recommend Cairo. Cairo is a genuinely scary movie. Um, Remade as Pulse here in the States to less effect. I've never never seen it. I refuse to watch it. It's one of my... I've seen it. I can't believe you've seen it. That's so funny. I'm hoping you will enjoy the original (laughs) much more. I'm sure. I'm sure I will. Uh-huh. Well, the reason I saw it was because Elizabeth bought me Rob Zombie's Halloween, and it came with Pulse, That's which did funny. not make any sense. It, it has so that girl like, you like, though, in it. Yes, Kristen Bell. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's a cutie. Had she not been in it, well, no, I'd have watched it because it was free, right. or it came with Halloween. I mean, it wasn't awful. Yeah. You know? Um, l- let me Let me put it to you this way. No one will ever, ever in their sane or deranged mind decide to remake Sick Nurses, so... Right. You're safe. <laughs> safe. But, uh, yeah, check those movies out, and we'll be back next time. And uh, not long after that, we'll be delving back into Euro Horror again. I love me some Euro Horror. Because that's how we roll, y'all. That's how we roll. So... Good night, folks. Thanks for listening. Hell yeah. Keep it flip on the slippy tip. Don't trip. Just kick a dick or something. (laughs) That's it. That's our parting words. Kick a dick. (laughs) Oh, shit. That's funny. That's it. That's it. Kick a dick or something. (laughs) Kick a dick, kick a dick, kick a dick. Keep it flip on the slippy tip. That's it, that's it. Don't trip, just that's it, that's it. Kick a dick or something. Kick a dick, kick a dick, kick a dick. Keep it flip on the slippy tip. That's it, that's it. Don't trip, just that's it, that's it. Kick a dick or something. Kick a dick, kick a dick, kick a dick. Keep it flip on the slippy tip. That's it, that's it. Don't trip, just that's it, that's it. Kick a dick or something. Kick a dick, kick a dick, kick a dick.